Hey guys, I'm the 50s Kid. We are continuing with the M54 engine rebuild project. And in this video, I think we're going to be cleaning up the, the head of the block as well as the cylinder head itself. Um, and then we'll also get into measuring the cylinder head for warpage. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to measure the block for warp because I my, the, the straight edge that I have is actually too long. It's a three foot straight edge and the block is just a little bit under two feet. So there's not enough room in the engine bay. I'd have to, I think I would, I would have to already have the front of the car off uh, if I were to use the three foot straight edge. So I got to think of something else for that. Um, but anyway, let's get started. I'm going to be using solvent to clean up the surface and my solvent of choice is general purpose lacquer thinner. Um, I can't get the same lacquer thinner here in California that the rest of you guys can get. Uh, so if I want to get the, the good stuff that still has methanol and toluene in it and not just all acetone, I have to go to the auto body store to get it. So I did and I just got a little bit of it in here. Now this is the head gasket. We're gonna set that aside. Incidentally, I'm not noticing much. I mean, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of failure there. You can see a little path through, which is actually interesting. That, that feels more like physical damage, which is really surprising to me. Oh, and then right here, there's, there's damage there too. So I think more, more or less, this is looking like a gasket failure more, at least at this point, more than a warped head and an overheat situation. Because again, I would have expected, uh, in an overheat situation, I would have expected the threads to have been pulled. So this is kind of looking better and better. Now, um, you can see I've already kind of cleaned up a test pattern, right, uh, test area right here, just to make sure that it would be coming off. Some people will use one of these cookie wheels to clean up, a, you know, like a, a, a surface area. Now, if it's steel, this is fine. This is, I think this is like uh, the equivalent of 120 or 150 grit. If it's a steel block, you can go ahead and use one of these. If it's a steel head, you can use one of these. That's acceptable. But if it's aluminum, you cannot use this. This will change aluminum and it will, uh, it will give you problems because here's the thing. This, this is not a graphite. Um, head gasket. This is a multi-layer steel gasket. See? Multiple layers of steel. So the head finish has to be perfect down to uh, down to like the micrometer scale. They actually have a, a device called a profilometer which will actually put out a little ruby stylus and it'll feel along the aluminum or the surface and it'll it'll calculate a surface finish in um, a unit called RA which I think is like arithmetic average something like that um, so if you go ahead and use one of these cookie wheels you're gonna screw up the RA finish and you could have problems with your uh, multi your new multi-layer steel gasket sealing so I'm definitely definitely not gonna use this I'll use this to clean up the front right here which down here where, where the, uh, the, the thermostat housing goes because that is, uh, that's a rubber gasket that's sealing to that surface. So who cares about the RA finish there? This will be fine for there, but I'm not gonna use this on the top. Instead, I'm gonna use steel wool to just kind of help me. It just, this is the lightest abrasive that I can possibly find. It's uh, quadruple zero. So it's the like finest steel wool that I could possibly find. I had a new one, but I can't, I can't find it. So this is all I have left. I'm going to try to use this for now and just do like a little bit at a time and just kind of come in here and work it. And see, that's going to work nicely might take a little bit of elbow grease, you know, but I, I don't really mind that. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. You'll notice, see there, it's going to clean that. The solvent's doing real well. That lacquer thinner is doing really good to clean that, that gunk off of there. And um, yeah, so I'll just kind of work at this for a little while. I'm not going to film the whole thing, obviously because that just would, you know, it's going to take forever. But you can see this is all you really need to get the whole 
the whole thing clean. Now, the reason we want to have it clean is because we need a perfectly flat surface to measure against to check uh, clearances and such. So you can't just check clearances with all this dirt and, and stuff caked on here. By the way, as far as what this is, I mean, if it is a multi-layer steel gasket, why are we seeing this black stuff all around here? My theory about what it is, honestly, it's probably like microscopic blow by gases or, or, you know, just microscopic gases, um, with oil dissolved in them getting past the, the, the steel head gasket on, uh, you know, every other stroke or something like that over time, that stuff just kind of builds up. And then of course the engine is really hot. So that stuff just kind of bakes in, in the little crevices. That's my theory as to what that is. Anyway, I'm going to go get this thing cleaned up and then we'll measure it. My steel wool is disintegrating on me very rapidly, guys. So um, I might have to I might have to stop here, honestly, because I can see little bits of it kind of falling in various places. And I don't really this thing's going to be hot tanked anyway, but I still don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to get it everywhere. Um, but you see how how nicely that lacquer thinner is actually dissolving most of the stuff. Um, there's going to be a lot of hard deposits on these valves here, some more than others. Um, maybe it would need to soak in that lacquer thinner to get those off, but I'm actually going to clean the valves um, with a brass wire wheel on my grinder a little bit later. But if you didn't have a grinder, um, pro possibly soaking these in lacquer thinner for a little while would uh, help you in that case, you know, once you took them out and such. But um, I can also see that my my choice of the uh, the steel wool is actually leaving little fibers everywhere as well. So that is, is something to be concerned about if you're if you weren't planning on getting the valves out, which, you know, I, I think you probably should. But um, just I want to I want you to keep that in mind. Um, you'll have to spray those out, wash those out, spray those out somehow, make sure everything's clean. So I did actually get the surface clean. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. I want to get this, this plate off the back here. It looks like it's just two tens. So I'll have to bag those. I also want to get this uh, coolant temperature sensor off the back there. It's a 22. Yeah, I remember I already cracked it free a little while ago. Um, another thing I want to take out right now is the, uh, the check valve, the anti drain back check valve. And the only reason I want to get it out is so that I can clean it properly. So as you can see, it's just a little ball bearing, spring loaded ball bearing. That's all it is. doesn't need to be replaced. just needs to be cleaned out. I'm going to flip this back around cause I want to show something. Let's zoom in here on the interface between five and six. So what I think is interesting is that I can definitely see that the exhaust gases were getting past um, on the cylinder head here. I can see the, the, the clear marking where they were getting past. And I can only see that with, um, so here's the, here's the head gasket. If we turn it over, you can definitely see that on the gasket itself. And then you can see that on, you know, between four and five a little bit. But then if we look on the underside of the gasket, when you look at between, you know, three and four right there, that's actually like broken right there. And here's between two and three. Here's between two and three. You can definitely see it on the unders underside as well. So when you take a head to a machine shop, they want to be able to actually put the head down on a flat surface so that they are going to be able to machine the, uh, the, the bottom at the bottom surface that we need them to machine. And the problem with this head is these bolts are sticking up above the surface right here. So we have to get all of these bolts out. Um, otherwise the machine shop's going to charge us for that. I mean, you can opt to let them do that. They'll, they'll just charge you for it, but I'm going to get these out. So, wow. Now, to get these studs out of here, 
you want to take two of the bolts that are that went on the uh, that held the cam caps down and they're both 11 millimeters you need two 11 millimeter wrenches to do this you're going to tighten them together and then use the bottom one to actually get the bolts out to get the bolt free and then i'm going to loosen the bolts and then just move on to the next one i think probably what i'll do is I think I might, yeah, I'll have enough bolts for it. I'll just put all the bolts on all of them, tighten them all together, crack them all free, get them all off, and then just spin the studs out by hand, or at least make sure that I can spin the studs out by hand. It's gonna be really meticulous, really boring, but that's what this kind of work is. I'm also gonna remove the valves. Once I remove them, I won't be able to get them back in once these, these bolts or these studs are out. So, at this point, I do believe I'm ready to remove them. I don't need the valves in there for any other reason. So as you can see, I've got them all on now, and I think I'll just kind of do them all in a batch if I can, if I, you know, if I have the room to get these wrenches in here like this, which I think I do. And, you know, doing them in a batch this way seems, I guess, a little easier. Make it go a little quicker. And see, I'm making sure that I can spin the the studs out by hand first and then i'm using this to just pull off the top that was already that was already cracked off and then you know i can get these off by hand this way and then get the studs out by hand so there we go those studs look to be exactly the same so they could go in upside down or right side up, doesn't matter. So as you can see, I'm making progress. Really didn't take that long, about 10 minutes or so. So I've transferred the bolts onto the other sides and I'll get these off in the same way. I've got that all done. I think I now have carpal tunnel, but I've got it all done. So I think I'm gonna pull the valves out now, but I definitely wanna organize the springs, the retainers. I don't wanna mix any of these up. I don't know if they can be mixed up or not. They probably can, but um, I'm just not gonna do it. So I need to find something to organize that with. Hey, look at that. I just so happen to have an extra 24 divider storage container. So I've just got things labeled this way. Um, I'm gonna count, you know, one through 12 that way. So cylinder one is where one starts and just do the intake and the exhaust and put all the springs and the valve retainers and the keepers in here. And I think you guys have seen this before. Gonna give it a good hit. There is also a little, a little valve seat. Uh, I don't know. Is it a washer? I don't know what you call it, but it's actually right here. And you need to pull those out as well. So I'm just gonna do that for all the valves and get everything off. So that's everything from the intake side removed. Um, I'll move on to the exhaust side. I'm gonna leave the valve stem seals in there because they're kind of holding the valves in. That way when I flip the thing over, the valves won't slide out. Um, and then I can just remove the valves one at a time from, from the, other, the other side. I was missing one of my keepers when I did this valve just now. And I stopped what I was doing and looked around and I found it on the ground. You always wanna do that. So I'm sure you all noticed that I forgot one of these. Pulled it off right now. So for the valves, I'm gonna use a cardboard box and I've just got this nice little flap here. What I'm gonna do is poke the valves through the box and then close the flap and then I can turn it upside down and store the valves like that. So we'll start with the intake because they're bigger. Okay, anyway, it's not pretty, but 
it's gonna work. So I can just turn that over and set them down like that. So I've scraped most of my, um, my gasket material off of here, and now I'm gonna use this to get, it, uh, get, it, get the rest of it off. So that got it most of the way off, or most of it off, but there's still like a little layer of it. So I'm gonna try the steel wool and the solvent. See how that does. This just proves to me how good the gray RTV is. It really does get into all the little nooks and crannies of the aluminum and definitely grabs on. So that's nice. The only reason I'm doing this is because I'm not sure if the hot tanking will get rid of it. Um, I assume it will. It probably will. But I don't know. All right, you know what? Good enough. If it doesn't get rid of it, I can get rid of it when it comes back. I've been using these um, hose pliers to pull off the valve stem seals. I found that they work really, really well. So just pull them off. I just tilt side to side like that and they come right off. Right now what I want to do is measure the valve tilt or the clearance, the rocking side to side that the valve can do in the valve guide. And you can see I've got the valve extended right here. What I've just done is I've reached up from underneath and I've made it so that the, the bottom of the valve is level with the bottom of the guide. So that's the position you want to measure it in. You can see I'm going back and forth, rocking it back and forth that way. Now my, my dial here is actually a, uh, a millimeter um, dial. And so <clears throat> one sweep all the way around is gonna be one millimeter. So each one of the 10, 20, 30, that's like 0.1 millimeters, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. So the maximum amount of uh, valve tilt that you can have is 0.5 millimeters. So if I see this gauge sweep all the way around, 180 degrees, that's too much. So just, you know, um, normally you can turn these gauges and turn the zero and, and zero it out, but I, I'm not on a solid enough surface. I'm on my steel workbench and I can push down on it and move the base a little too much. So uh, I don't, you know, I, every time I go and try to re-zero the dial, it kind of messes things up. So I'm just gonna leave it like this and I'm gonna rock it, just rock the valve. And as you can see, we've got, you know, 2.5, or maybe that's even 1.5. No, that's actually 2. 0.2 millimeters of clearance of valve tilt. So that's well within spec, and this is an intake valve. So I'm going to switch over to the exhaust side now. Okay, here we go. We're set up there. Hang on, I gotta get my finger underneath it so the valve doesn't move up and down. So we're about, what is that, 3.5? About 3.5, so a little more wear on the exhaust valves, but again, still within spec, so all good. I'm going to uh, just measure a couple of the other valves as well. I'm not going to do every single one because I can kind of tell, you know, I, I can feel how much tilt that is now and, and I'm kind of realizing, you know, I can, I can sort of match that tilt um, just by hand and just kind of see if they're good. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to do the rest of them and make sure nothing's, you know, wildly out of spec. So basically, all the other valves were about the same. Most of the exhaust valves are about 0.3 millimeters and most of the intakes were about 0.2. Okay, so we're finally at the part where we get to measure something. So take our straight edge, put that across right here. And the minimum amount of wear that you can have is actually two thousandths. And I don't have a two thousandths gauge, but I do have a 2.5. And you can see that that just goes very easily under all the way through. So let's just bump up. Let's jump up to uh, five thousandths. 
and I'm starting to feel resistance over here, but it's still going through quite easily. So let's go to six. It's still going through quite easily. Let's try seven. Seven. Hang on. Seven is going under. It won't go under here. So it won't go under here. It will go under here and here with just a little bit of resistance. Doesn't really want to go there. And the eight. Eight won't go. Eight's, eight doesn't want to go there. It tries to get under there, but there's resistance. But it can go. It can go. So we've got about eight thousandths of wear right, right in the middle. Now the, uh, again, the minimum that you can have is, is two thousandths. And, uh, so that means this, this block definitely has to be machined and the maximum amount that you can machine this block before it's unusable is 13 thousandths. So well within margin, I can definitely get this thing, uh, this block decked one time. So that's fine. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to flip this thing over. We're also going to check the other side because what we want to know is, is the block also warped up here? You know, has the whole block uh, lifted up like this or is it just the bottom surface? So that'll be interesting. Am I going to get, am I going to get a rocking here? And yeah, I do get a little bit of a rocking back and forth, like a teeter-totter sort of situation. But it doesn't feel like a lot. So let's go ahead and try, oh, I lied, I do have a 2000s feeler gauge, haha. <laughs> let's try that 2000s. Well, it's gonna be tightest in here, so let's try it on the edges here. So that 2000s goes under. Let's go up to the three. 3000s goes under. Starts to catch right, right around here. So it goes under there, goes under there. Again, starts to catch right around there. So four thousandths. That really doesn't want to go. Feels like, I mean, there's resistance. It can get under easily there. I start to hit resistance right around this area. And so we'll go there. Little resistance, resistance. Five thousandths, five thousandths doesn't want to go. There's resistance there. If we check it over here, there's resistance. It wants to move the gauge. Resistance, it's going under over here. So it's probably, you know, let's call it four or five thousandths. Now my engine rebuilding textbook does say that the maximum amount of uh, total head warp that you want, like if, if the entire head is warped like this, the, the maximum amount of warpage you want to detect along the top is two thousandths on an aluminum block. So uh, this head is definitely warped as well. It's definitely heat warped. Uh, so I'm pretty much thinking that this thing is gonna need to be uh, straightened by the machine shop before it's decked. Um, this brings up kind of an interesting question. We're detecting eight thousandths of warp on the bottom, but only what, four thousandths of warp on the top. So what's up with that? You know, why would there be more on the bottom and less on the top? Um, it turns out, I guess the prevailing theory for this is that, you know, uh, during the combustion process, every time the power stroke happens, that's basically like a mini explosion in each cylinder. And I guess those expanding gases actually hammer on the metal on the underside and they actually compress the metal in. So that's why we're seeing more warpage on the bottom. We're getting a compression effect on the metal on the bottom, whereas uh, this warp we're seeing across the whole head is, is just warp from you know too many heating cycles. So I wanted to give you guys like a closer up look at the valves. Um, so the intake valves are actually really nice. So that's number one intake valve. You know, we've got carbon on the surface, okay? But there's no, car there's not much carbon buildup here. I'm, I mean, they're gonna clean up really nicely. I mean, this is just varnish, really. It doesn't feel like carbon at all. I can still sort of feel most of the texture of the metal right there. The carbon right here, though, is completely covering the metal. It's like a, you know, it's just a hard crust that's going on. But 
not all of the valves have that. I think actually number one is the worst. Here's number three, and actually this is number two. And as you can see, that's metal right there. I mean, it's just a very light coating. I can clean that up chemically probably. So the all the backs of the valves, of the intake valves are pretty similar. So yeah, those are really nice. Now the, the exhaust valves have a lot more carbon buildup on the tops of them. And number one actually has the worst buildup of anything. These are just totally and completely pitted here. But the funny thing is the valve seats on number one are not. It's just the valves that have almost all the buildup. And you can see there's a ton of buildup here. So the exhaust valves are going to need the most cleaning. But uh, it's just very interesting that number one is much, much worse than here. Let's just take number three, for instance. So number three, I mean, there's still build up there, but it doesn't have that white build up that the rest of them have. And I mean, here's number one. This one doesn't have a lot of carbon build up at all, actually. This one, you know, I can still feel the metal almost. I can almost feel the metal there. So I just think it's uh, quite interesting. And uh, this is how I'm going to clean up the valves. So I'm going to wrap the stems with tape because I'm going to chuck them in my drill here because I'm going to chuck them in my drill and spin them while I'm actually cleaning them up on my brass wire wheel right here. So. So here's what number one exhaust valve looks like now that it's been cleaned up. It's been cleaned up really nicely. There's still a little bit of crusty on the, on the face of the valve, but um, I think I can soak that in solvent and just kind of get that to soften a little bit. And then I can just, you know, keep going at it with the, the brass wire wheel and it'll eventually come off. And you can also see that I hit the grooves of the, uh, the keepers with the wire wheel just to kind of clean off the surface varnish. So this time I soaked this valve in a little bit of solvent, so we'll see how that does. So that actually did much better than that first one that really got off all the carbon. So yeah, if you've got like thick deposits on the top, just soak it in some lacquer thinner for, I don't know, I soaked it for about a minute or two. So with a little more time on the grinder, the number one exhaust valve came perfectly clean. Well, that's it for the valves. Really didn't take too long. Brass wire wheel bench grinder. So this is a number two exhaust valve and you can see there's quite a bit of pitting on the surface of that valve and let's compare that with an intake valve. You can see that there's no pitting on that one. That one's you know still got a, a pretty smooth surface but basically these valves are going to have to be refaced. Uh, professionally refaced. They just take it and they grind a perfect 45 degree on it. You can see that the valve seats, these are the, these are the exhaust valve seats right here. You can see that they're in much better shape than those exhaust valves are, but they're still not absolutely perfect. They look shiny. They look like they've been polished by the valves over time, but they're still not perfect. There's still a little bit of pitting on them. So the, the, the seats are definitely going to have to be recut as well. And I'm going to get a nice three angle, 
uh, valve job done on them so you get that nice radius for the air to flow over better. So the head's warped and it needs to be fl you know, flattened and it needs to be resurfaced. Uh, we're seeing eight thousandths of warp on this side. So I'm thinking that is probably the reason that this head gasket did fail. Um, I don't think that this was an inferior head gasket and you know it was just made wrong or whatever. I think that this head warped over time due to you know maybe a, an overheating incident or maybe just you know it, maybe that's just the normal wear over time for all of these cylinder heads. They're all going to be eight thousandths uh warped when you know they're they're getting close to 200,000 miles it's going to go to the machine shop they're going to pressure test it what they do is they block off all the coolant passages and they you know insert compressed air and if it doesn't leak then you're all good if it does there's some internal crack somewhere and you can't use it they'll get it hot tanked you know it's all crudded up all the you know the water passengers there's crud in there you know the oil passages have crud so uh, it's going to get hot tanked and cleaned up and they will straighten it and they will resurface it. The exhaust valve guides are worn. They're at 0.3 millimeters to, you know, 0.35 millimeters, um, which is excessive. That's more than halfway through their life. It's probably just going to be a good idea to get those exhaust valve guides replaced. The intake ones I think are fine. They're, you know, at 0.2 millimeters of wear. So I think that they'll be fine and I probably won't have to get those replaced. Let's talk about valve lapping. Valve lapping is where you put your old valve in, you use some paste like valve lapping compound and you can get this kind it comes in two sizes there's a coarse and a fine and you know you just put a little bit of the uh the the compound on there put the valve in in there you know you put a little oil on it you squish down this little valve lapping handle it's just a little suction cup squeezes down and you just kind of do this you rotate this down and you just you're sort of grinding the face of the valve into the seat and you're, you're just grinding them together in order to grind out that corrosion and that pitting. Um, but here's the thing, you, you really shouldn't do this on a modern engine, I have come to realize. I've come to realize it the hard way uh, because you can see that I've already done it on number one valves. I've already tried this. Um, I followed a popular video on YouTube made by Jaffro Mobile. Makes great videos by the way, but I feel like now that I know, now that I've seen what happened and what I've done, and, and now that I've realized that something wasn't quite right, I've gone ahead and I've looked into it further and I've read more and I've delved more deeply into textbooks and whatnot and into the comments of that video even and, and so on. And I've realized that you don't want to do this valve lapping on a modern engine. This is, you know, it's not intended for you to take your pitted, you know, your pitted valves and grind them down against the seats and grind all the pitting off. It, you're not meant to do that because what you're actually doing is you're increasing the contact patch of the valve. You can see now that there's a really wide gray area on this valve, whereas if we compare it to, so if you compare it to an unlapped valve, you can see where the, the contact patch was on that unlapped valve, you can see how much smaller it was. And the, you, want, you, know, you want the smallest contact patch you can get because the, uh, the bigger the contact patch is, the less pressure the spring exerts over any, uh, over any square inch of the valve face. So you wanna keep that contact patch as small as possible. And uh, that's why you definitely don't wanna lap your valves. Apparently, valve lapping should only be used in order, you know, as a tool to figure out if your valves are bent or not. If you have, if, you know, if you take your valves and you just lightly lap them in and you pull them out and you check, you should see a concentric strip of gray on them. And then you will know that, you know, that valve is good. That valve can actually be professionally refaced and uh, then used. So that is how you're supposed to use valve lapping in the context of modern engine rebuilding. I now realize, I have now learned the hard way that that is the case. So uh, I recommend that you do not lap your valves in and you definitely get a professional valve job redone. You know, they, they have a professional machine that 
puts the valve in a fixture and it grinds it against a stone perfectly and uh, all that stuff. Another thing that you want to avoid is you can see how there's a little, there, you know, at the very tip of the valve that you can see where the angle stops and it just kind of goes, it almost goes straight on, you know, so there's like a, there's a, a tip to this valve that's actually sticking up above the seat. And it's important that you not actually grind so much material away that you, that you create a, a sharpened point on the end of the valve. Cause if you do that, you're going to get a burned valve that way. So that's another reason why you don't want to lap, you know, the old fashioned way, because you're just going to have to grind away too much of the metal in order to actually get it to seat. And uh, what I've actually done while I was doing the valve lapping, I, what I did was I, you know, I had all the valves in once I had lapped them all in and I actually had a spark plug in here as well. And I filled up the chamber with some water and I was just pressing down on the valves and blowing compressed air in through the ports and seeing if they leaked. And I found that I got the front two to not leak, but the back two were still leaking and still needed more lapping to be done. And you know, it, it was at that point that I just realized I was going too far with it. You know, that's the, the, you know, I knew that there was something wrong. I could just tell. So I have learned the hard way not to do this. Hopefully I did not take these too far. Hopefully I didn't damage them. I don't think that I did, at least not the intakes anyway. The exhausts, there might be, hopefully, you know, there might be an issue with them because I can sort of see that I've ground in almost a little bit of a dish pattern, like a sort of dish pattern at this way, at, you know, this way. So hopefully I didn't take them too far. Hopefully they can just get a new face put on them. Um, but if I did, then, you know, I'll just get two used valves from the junkyard. Not a big deal. Um, I don't think that I took very much off the seat itself. So that should be fine. So make sure that you get a professional valve job done during your rebuild. Don't use a valve lapping handle. It's not the way to go. It's not the professional way to go. I'm not saying that this cannot be done and that this will not work. I mean, technically speaking, I understand if you're rebuilding like a, some engine on, you know, on the farm somewhere and you're miles from a machine shop, I understand that people lap their valves in and, you know, it will make it better, obviously. Uh, you know, if, I, if, if we left these valves as they are, pitted as they are, they're not going to seal. And if we do go ahead, you know, if I do lap them the way that I have, I'm obviously getting better sealing. I got these two to actually seal. So it's possible to get it to seal, but it's not the best, it's, it's not what you should do in today's modern age. You should get them professionally refaced. You should get a modern valve job done. So I'm telling you to get the modern valve job done and not to do it yourself, but Again, I understand if you're, you know, if you're rebuilding a tractor engine or something like that, yes, people still do, you know, lap valves in. And I understand there are going to be those of you out there who are watching this, who have, you know, lapped valves on a modern engine and put it in their car, installed it, and it's still working today. I get that that might be the case, but I'm realizing now that I can't recommend that you do valve lapping, uh, as a normal part of doing a, a rebuild like this. You have to get a professional valve job done in today's day and age. So we're gonna just do a time-lapse cleaning of the block, just cleaning it in the exact same way as the head using quadruple zero steel wool and some lacquer thinner. By the way, if, you, um, if you're not actually removing your block to machine it and everything, just put some blue paper towels in the cylinders to protect them. You just wanna, um, the steel wool flakes off little bits of, of steel every now and then. You just wanna prevent that from getting down into the, uh, the cylinders. And also you might wanna consider blocking off the oil return holes right here. And then the two oil feed holes with just a little bit of paper towel. Um, again, just to prevent filings from getting in there.
Well, that should be good enough. Um, it really doesn't take that long. You know, seal wool does a really great job of it. So at this point, to actually get all those filings out, I don't know if you can see them, but I can definitely see them. Let me soak up whatever lacquer thinner fell down in here. And definitely wipe a lot of it out. But then you can also blow the rest of it out with compressed air. So don't be too worried. As long as you got compressed air, you can definitely get that thing cleaned. So this is definitely good enough for right now. Um, if I was gonna put the head back on and the gasket back on, I would definitely spend a little more time and get every little tiny bit of black crusty off of here. Um, but for right now, this is, this is definitely good enough. Again, I'm pulling the block off uh, out of the car and it's gonna get cleaned at the machine shop, so. I just wanted to demonstrate kind of, you know, the process and, and what you would go through. It's really, really easy. Don't worry about it. It's not too hard. I definitely recommend compressed air. That is, you know, um, that, that's particularly important. Uh, one other thing I didn't clean or I didn't mention is bef I definitely want to clean the top rim of each cylinder. Um, and the reason is here, you can see how high the piston goes about right here, but that doesn't mean the ring comes all the way up there. The ring actually, you can see where the ring comes to. There's, there's definitely a quarter inch of carbon in there. And I can feel along, right here it feels smooth, but up here on the top I can feel, you know, some crusty stuff. And it's basically like that on every cylinder. And the thing is, you wanna get that out of there before you go ahead and pull the, the pistons out. I don't wanna damage the old rings. Again, it's not, you know, they're old rings. It doesn't really matter about the old rings, but you definitely wanna get it out of there before you put the new rings in. Now you can go ahead and clean the tops of the pistons as well, again, using solvent. And you don't have to use steel wool for this. You can use something a little more aggressive, like a, a green scotch pad or something, because the tops of the pistons don't have to be perfectly machined. You know, it, it's all right if you kind of, you know, mess them up microscopically, that is. And, um, and then the, the sides of the, the the sides of the pistons are lined with cast iron, so you can definitely scrub that with a 3M pad, so with a, with a scour pad. So that is not too big of a deal. You can do that, or you can use the steel wool. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter. I think the 3M pad would probably be a little more aggressive and, and would get the, the carbon off a little quicker. This is piston number one right here, and you can see this area right here where there's no carbon. This is where some of the coolant was sitting. I, I just kind of left it sit there overnight because I didn't have any paper towels that night when I, when I called it quits. And uh, when I came back and wiped it, yeah, it got that carbon off. So that, that's, that was pretty interesting, you know? I mean, just coolant will definitely kind of eat into that carbon and get it off of there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one interesting thing that I noticed. I wanted to point out to you guys. Another thing is, let me show you cylinder two, you can see cylinder two has very little carbon on it, nowhere near as much as number one does. And it has the least amount of carbon um, than all the pistons. And I think that sort of proves that number two is where uh, that coolant was leaking into and just cleaning off that piston over time. So yeah, I thought that was interesting as well. So now that we do have the engine block clean, the next step would be to measure it just like the, we measured the cylinder head to see if it's warped at all. Usually blocks don't warp that much. Well, usually blocks are steel and they, you know, they usually don't warp at all. Um, an aluminum block, I think, is a little more prone to warping than a, than a steel block is, or a cast iron block, I should say. However, cylinder heads are really where all the warpage occurs because that's where most of the heat is the heat you know the the explosion is taking place up in the cylinder area the cylinder head area right here and that's where the majority of the heat is so uh that's why blocks don't usually warp if you're just doing a cylinder head just you know uh probably nine times out of ten you can go ahead and just pop your your machine cylinder head on and you'll probably be fine 
So that is it for cleaning and measuring the cylinder head. That gets us all the way to the machine shop. We can deliver the head to the machine shop, have them do the work, then we'll get it back, and then we'll do the final reassembly, and then we can get it back in the car. And between them, of course, I'm gonna be pulling out the bottom end and doing a whole host of stuff on that. Uh, if you want to follow me, the, me on uh, Facebook and Instagram, you can do that, and I, I will give you project updates there um, as, as we go on. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I'm the 50s Kid. Thanks a lot for watching.